Hi. And welcome to 2011 studies. And this is my real voice. Ha 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 ha. Hi again. Welcome to 2011 studies. This is chapter 20. And the all important solemn assembly. If I had to select an Old Testament book of the Bible to gain understanding about the time we are rapidly approaching, I would choose the book of Joel. The book of Joel is only three chapters, but it is packed with information. And the information such as God removing the northern, who is Satan, and then performing great things is valuable to understand. Performing great things or being magnified is what Satan does prior to God turning the tables. This is Joel 2.20. Joel 2.20, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Joel 2.21 Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. The day of the Lord is also mentioned in Joel 2, and in fact that term was quoted by Peter at the time of Pentecost, as found in the book of Acts. However, we learn that Joel 2 can have a dual fulfillment in history. We also learned in this book that the month Adar seems important for the grand turnaround found in the book of Esther. Does the reversal mention in the book of Joel relate to Adar in one important year coming up? It may very well be. The letters of truth and peace, the gospel, must go forth in a great way prior to Christ's coming. There are certain phrases in the Bible that also give us clues to the timing of certain events and how they relate to God's important feasts. One such term found in the book of Joel in the context, and in the context, it sure does sound like the great marriage feast of the bride and the bridegroom. In other words, the grand uniting time of Christ with the body of believers worldwide. The phrase in question is the solemn assembly. Let's look at the verses from the book of Joel that mention the phrase solemn assembly. Solemn assembly of Joel 2, return of the Lord. Joel 2.12 Joel 2.12 Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, Joel 2.13 And rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Joel 2.14 Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Joel 2.15 Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, Joel 2.16 Gather the people, Sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. When we search the Bible for the phrase bride and bridegroom, there seems to be a real connection with Christ and his people, a time of rejoicing, a time of salvation. Isaiah 61.10 Isaiah 61.10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation, he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. The entire impact of the bridegroom going forth of his chamber and the bride coming out of her closet signifies a time of rejoicing. The wedding is about to happen. When God reverses the captivity, the voice of joy is heard. Jeremiah 33:11 Jeremiah 33:11 the voice of joy and the voice of gladness the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride the voice of them that shall say praise the lord of hosts for the lord is good for his mercy endureth forever and of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the lord for i will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first saith the lord the time of joy seems accurate since the other passages of the bride groom and bride there was a much sadder picture a time of desolation this desolation was mentioned earlier in jeremiah so again a picture of a great reversal is underscored jeremiah 7 34 
Jeremiah 7:34 Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah, and from the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of mirth, and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. John the Baptist understood the analogy of Christ being the bridegroom and the body of Christ being the bride. John 3:28. John 3:28 Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. John 3:29 He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. In conclusion, we can see how this phrase bridegroom and bride is used in the Bible as an analogy of Jesus and his people. The phrase bride, groom, and bride can also represent a time when desolation is occurring where there is no joy. Likewise, when the captivity is over, then the joy returns as seen in Jeremiah 33. Below is the incredible language of a new heaven and new earth in association with the bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21 1. Revelation 21 1 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Revelation 21 2 And I John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21 3 And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. The call for repenting in Joel 2 and at Pentecost 33. The prophecy of Joel 2 was partially fulfilled at Pentecost 33 AD. I say partially because there is coming a time where repentance will become very important prior to Christ's return. Jesus, pe Jesus preached repentance because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was true during the original 1335 days and from 29 AD to 33 AD, but now as we approach the final 1335 days, it is even more true. The call for repentance at Pentecost, 33 AD, Acts 2.36. Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 2.37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The call for repentance in Joel 2. Joel 2.12 Joel 2.12 Therefore also now, saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, Joel 2.13 And rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Call for repentance from Jesus. Mark 1.14 Mark 1.14 Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mark 1.15 And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. We can assume that since Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and also proclaiming repent in 29 AD, that there will be a great time of repentance worldwide in our time. Why? Because the gospel of the kingdom will go into all the world as a witness unto the nations before the end will come. This blanketing of the gospel will happen within the 1335 days. Matthew 24 Matthew 24 12 And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Matthew 24 13 But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24 14 And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. In the next chapter, I want to address the important question of the disciples asked Jesus about the sign of his coming. Are we now seeing the very words of Jesus come to pass before our eyes? 
I say yes. There's a lot of um, information coming forth right now, and we're witnessing it. We're witnessing it worldwide. Um, and if you have any comments, leave your comments in the comment section. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, we have, this is 20, so we have 21, which is going to be the um, the chapter on the sign of thy coming. And a couple more after that. Then it's a wrap up on the, the reading of the book. And I know this is not easy to listen to my voice reading. <laughs> That's why I introduced the AI. I put some AI voices to read the scriptures because my voice, my speaking voice is very monotonous. I, I admit that. The, my singing voice is better than my, my talking voice. But anyway, um, I tried to plow through this uh, and it took a little while, but it's, it's pretty much a wrap up now and we're going to just do a couple more chapters. And then uh, as I do the corrections, it'll go into print. Anyway, that's it for now. My name is Marty Cattuzzo, and this is my real voice. <laughs> so, if you want to email me, it's 2011studies at gmail.com. And God bless you. Pray. Pray for salvation if you have not already. Thank you. Today is